talking about sparring today because it's a question that often pops up online. How come Sistema doesn't have any sparring in it and how come Sistema only ever trains slowly? These questions tend to come from outside of the Sistema community and people inside the community tend to find the, these questions are amusing or confusing because anyone who trains at a good club will tell you we do some kind of free play or free, free sparring pretty much every session and of course we work at all sorts of different speeds. Slow is purely for learning. So if you are experienced in Sistema, I apologise in advance, there's probably nothing here that you don't already know. But if you're new to Sistema, or you've got an interest in it, or thinking about taking it up, or if you're one of those people who asked that question, then what I'm going to try and do today is explain our approach to sparring. I'm going to try and keep this as succinct as I can. I'll try and stay on point as much as possible. The difficulty is, of course, with Sistema, as it's such a sort of holistic all-embracing art, how can we talk about doing work if we're not talking about breathing and posture, the four pillars and so on. So for today I'm going to take those as red. Uh, I'm just going to cover the subject quite broadly and hopefully give a good overview. Of course if you want more detail that's available on other vlogs here or also through our downloads and books and all the other material that's available. Or of course even better if you can get to a class and experience it for yourself. Obviously, under present circumstances, it's difficult to get groups of people together to film specific things. So I'm going to be drawing on some of our older footage. I've got a huge amount of footage going back 20 years. There's probably less than a tenth of it up online. Uh, and it's one of those rainy day projects. At some point in the future, I'll see if I can get more of that old footage up and available for people to see. So I'm going to split things down into some sections. Of course things overlap in many different ways, but just for clarity today, we're going to take a step-by-step -step approach. So we're going to begin with preparation. As much as we can in Sistema, or at least in our school of Sistema, we like to work with contact. I always felt myself that punching into air doesn't really achieve very much. Bags and pads have their uses for some exercises, but generally speaking, you want to work with another person or people as much as you can to get that full uh, sort of feedback. You never get the same feedback from an inanimate object. So as far as preparation goes, there are two issues. One is we need to get people used to contact. Now, by use of contact, I mean taking away some of the fear or trepidation over contact, but also understanding how the body works in response to contact. So the very first thing we do is start with pushing. People push each other using the hand or using the fist. And what we want to do at first is get people used to that idea and start getting them to relax in order to dissipate the energy of that push or later the strike. Now of course we can use tension as well later on but that tension needs to be controlled. What we're trying to avoid through doing this kind of work by getting people to relax at the start we're taking away that freeze response where someone gets hit or someone gets touched and the body locks up in fear, locks up with tension and it freezes. Now of course once people have got used to this we can start putting in heavier and heavier strikes and we can work this in all sorts of ways and all sorts of exercises. Quite often you see people standing still while they're hit by the instructor. This is partly about fear control, but there's whole other layers of training within that exercise as well, which I'm not, a, not going to go into today. But one part of that is getting used to contact and it's getting used to contact on both sides because as well as taking a hit, some people, it might sound surprising, are quite nervous about giving a hit as well. And of course it's not just hits, it's being grabbed, it's being locked, all those things as well. So again, we do all sorts of exercises where we apply locks, we apply grabs, and the person learns to control their response to that situation. So I guess we could classify this as attribute development, and I think this is where some of the confusion arises with Sistema. People see a drill like this, which is attribute development, and 
in their minds they sort of compartmentalize it as sparring or some sort of uh, simulation of a real life event. It's neither of those things, it's purely to develop these particular set of attributes. So the second aspect of preparation is working on our own, developing all these attributes and a, another very important aspect of this is the floor. We may be fighting on the floor so we need to be comfortable in that position. We also need to know safely how to get up and down either by ourselves or if we're thrown or taken down. So it's very important at some point in preparation as well to get back to working with a partner. You do solo falls, but then you can work with a partner taking you down and throwing in different ways. Because of course, if someone is unable to protect themselves while they're falling, then it would be very irresponsible for anyone to, to carry out some sort of throw on them, particularly some of the nasty ones where you twist people in midair and so on. So that's the preparation, getting the body ready for the work getting the psyche ready for the work, whether that's through taking hits, giving hits, being in close, going to the floor, being thrown, and so on. And that, by the way, that's not just preparation at the start and then you never do it again. That's an ongoing process because we're always looking to become more efficient for our work to become cleaner and smoother and so on. So <laughs> there's always plenty of room for improvement there. So next comes the learning phase and we'll approach this in a couple of different ways. We might show a specific method or technique and then develop from that. We might explore a certain set of principles, for example the triangulation principle in applying locks and just let people sort of apply those as best they can and again the instructor will give a few pointers as we go. Once we've done that in a kind of static way then we'll bring in the element of free play. So it could be if we're talking about locks or holds, for example, we'll start slow and we'll say to one person, now try and apply the lock on that person. And this person, if he can, he tries to escape. And as I said, this, this will be done slowly at first because what we want people to do is not focus on the experience or the fear or the adrenaline of the situation at this stage but purely on those technical issues of placement of being accurate and precise in our work and so on so there's not a lot of uh, pressure involved at that stage the next step from there is start to increase the speed start to increase levels of resistance and of course we still stick to that brief if we're working chokes or whatever it is then that's all we're allowed to do at the moment is to try and apply it or try and escape and maybe apply the choke back for example. So we're keeping things fairly limited still but we can start to increase the pressure. One important thing I mentioned levels of resistance there and this is a whole other, other big subject in itself but briefly there are different types of resistance. There's the resistance that comes when I know what technique the other person is going to apply, say he's going to apply the classic sort of wrist lock, so I can very easily resist it because I know what's going to happen. Of course there's ways around that. The second type of resistance is through fear and that comes when the person tenses in fear through what's happening to them. They may be not trying to actively resist as such but that fear creates tension and so again we have to adapt and work around that. The third type of resistance is what we might call uh, unfocused resistance. I'm just going to try and stop the person doing whatever they're doing in any way they can. There's no other thought other than, than to resist what's happening. And the last type is what we can call focused resistance, where I'm not only resisting what the person is doing, or I'm resisting the, what the person is doing by trying to counter it. And this is the most useful one for sparring terms. Of course, we may have to work through all those other levels as well. But once we hit this stage, then we really get into our sparring work. So from there, we can broaden things out. So if we're working with grabs, for example, now the brief is just to see if you can grab and lock the person up. There's no limit on what type of method or technique you use. The other person can apply whatever amount of resistance is appropriate or they can work to counter each other and again this will be graded from slow work up to faster work. 
we can start adding in punches or kicks or whatever else we want to do and again that will be at a level that is suitable for the people involved that doesn't mean that experienced guys every single session are hammering each other sometimes we go to that point what we'll call testing which we'll speak about later and then to refine it we'll bring it back down to that slow movement again so it's a little bit like the preparation it's not that you only prepare or you, or you only do slow work at the start this is a continuous process throughout you learn it slow you apply it slow you build up speed you take it up to testing you look at the faults or the instructor helps you look at the faults and then you bring it back down to slow again to refine the work This is where we start getting into our ideas of free play and I use the word play advisedly because it is very appropriate to this type of work. Animals and to some extent humans as well learn about fighting, learn about a lot of things through play. This is how we begin to learn to deal with things that happen to us particularly things involving other people so that can be on a physical level it can be on a social level but we learn a lot through play so something that's built into Sistema is this notion of play and I know that's not always very popular with some people because they like to think of sparring as being a uh, tough you know everything has to be aggressive and tough all the time and I've even drawn criticism on a couple of occasions for when we're doing knife work for example for having people smile or being light-hearted while they're doing it well there's a specific reason for that but again that's one of those details we don't have time to go into today so this notion of play is very important and if you really want to look at play and play fighting then i point you towards my friend bruno caverna who's made an in-depth study of this and applied it in so many ways and to so many different things I'll put a link up to him in the notes below. If you're interested in that area, then I highly recommend you look at Bruno's work. So from my perspective, when we look at play, what we're trying to do is extend the situation. If we are unfortunate enough to be involved in some sort of violent encounter, whether it's verbal or physical, or verbal leading to physical, we want to finish that as soon as possible in whichever way that can be escaping it can mean engaging whatever right but we want to finish that as quickly as possible because the longer it goes on the more variables creep in to the equation this could happen that could happen etc etc um, if we get a violent attack in the street no one's going to start sparring they want to stop that as quickly as they can so that's the first thing by play we're looking to extend the experience so you hit but you're not hitting to damage the person. You might win them a bit perhaps, but that's, that's another thing. When you apply a lock, you're not breaking. When you apply the throw or the takedown, you're not necessarily gonna slam the person down to the floor in the same way as you would in real life. Sometimes as well, if you get your partner, let's say you, uh, I've got my partner wrapped up and he's finding it difficult, then I might pause there to give him an opportunity to work out if he can get free from this movement. So we're giving each other a little bit of uh, slack or space as well, because this is a game. Now a game can be serious of course, if we're looking at combat sports for example, yeah, they're working within a set of rules, but nonetheless the two guys are really trying to dominate each other. So there's that, but there's also the issue that no one is intentionally trying to harm the other person by whatever means necessary. So even at some levels, an intense combat sport still has an element of play about it because it's a match. Of course, it's a very demanding one physically and mentally, but that's what it is. Now, play can be on different levels, of course. We like at first just to get people working into a flow of things to encourage their movement, to encourage their footwork, their positioning, their coordination. So we start off with a kind of back and forth. Now one other thing I found very useful is when we work in pairs we tend to get very focused on one person. That's okay but again we're always working for uh, if you like worst case scenario so we always assume there's another person. So it's very good sometimes to take that free play 
partners, good, but then put in three people, put in four people, and of course that goes right up. I, th I think the biggest I've seen is maybe like 150 people <laughs> working uh, sort of mass attack stuff, which is, uh, you know, it's a good exercise. It's uh, an eye opener if you've never been in that kind of situation before. It's very common when you see what we'll call conventional sparring for both people to be wearing protective gear. We do use some of this stuff a little bit. Personally, I like to use it a little bit, but only if we really have to. The issue for me with wearing protection, if you pardon the expression, is that it compromises our work in some ways and it limits us in some ways as well. Now, of course, every training method that isn't a real fight there's an element of compromise involved as long as we recognize that then that is fine what i want to avoid is the idea we've got everyone suited and booted and i've, I've seen this on online for example guys spend five minutes doing sparring with all this gear on and there's maybe one or two hits like good hits landed for most of the time they're keeping distance they're, they're bobbing about they're weaving about so if you're going to wear the gear then at least go for it. Where I do find it useful is when we get guys in who perhaps haven't got so much experience of that environment. So some of the guys at the club, for example, have been Thai boxers or boxers or street fighters. They're used to that situation. If a person isn't, then it's a good thing sometimes to get the gear on them, to give them a little bit of confidence, they feel protected and put them up against it. So milling type drills or that type of uh, exercise and of course we're not just throwing them in and expecting them to deal with that but we teach the breathing we teach how to control the nervous system how to control the fear of tension that comes out of that situation so that's the purpose for that kind of sparring yeah it isn't just battering someone for the sake of it and telling them to toughen up you know you've got to give the people the tools to help them cope with the situation Another thing about using gear, whether it's gloves or sometimes we get people to hold the pads in front of the body, is of course your partner can come in with stronger and stronger, pretty much full power strikes. Uh, it takes away the fear from the striker's perspective of going in too deep and hurting the person too much. So it's a good way to get feedback from hitting the person, even with that protective gear, but at least feeling that you can put the strikes into the target. So we've developed all these attributes. We can, uh, we can balance on the head of a pin. We can hold our breath for 20 minutes. We've got the coordination of a, of a master juggler. Of course, we need to test all of this uh, because quite often we find that our skill level never raises quite to the heights that we expect it under pressure. Now, again, with the testing, it isn't a real situation. There is always that element of knowing that this is an exercise. But there are certain ways we work around that and I'm not gonna reveal any today because a lot of them involve an element of surprise, <laughs> for example. And of course this testing doesn't have to be physical in the sense of fighting. There's lots of other ways to test people's fear control and the capability of their breath work. From a sparring context, I find the most useful type of drill is what I call goal-based sparring. So we put a time limit on this because now we're not looking at that play element. We don't want to extend it. We want to give a person quite a short window of time in order to carry out their goal. And it could be something like one person has to get another person out through that door. Or it could be that two people have got to go in, take that person down and restrain them. And again, you'll notice a lot in Sistema, we're not always working just on that one-to-one -one thing. It could be two one-to-one. -one. The two good guys could be door staff, for example, who have to restrain a rowdy customer. Or it could be that they're bad guys. They're two guys who are gonna come and try and rob you, for example. So we set up these little situations and we'll give the person maybe 30 seconds or a minute or whatever it is, whatever's appropriate. Uh, in order to test their skills in that particular area. Now, of course, it's a simulation, so 
we get back to this earlier idea of the fools. The better I am at taking hits, the less it affects my ego, my nervous system, the more able I am to protect myself from a good hit, then the more intense that drill could be. My partner is confident that he can give me a good crack and I'm going to be able to deal with it on every level. Because of course, when you get into this area, we start touching on emotions and ego as well. No one likes getting hit in the face, but if the person responds with anger and aggression, then it is possible for these uh, sort of uh, sessions to flare up into something else. So as an instructor, you have to be aware of that. But if you've put people through all that preparation work, I've never found it an issue, or very rarely found it an issue. I can't think, I think one occasion where we've had to remove someone from training. But apart from that, everyone understands the purpose of the drill. The purpose of the drill is not to defeat the purpose of the drill. So that testing sparring can be quite a simple thing. It can give people a simple goal, as we said before. Or you can make it quite elaborate. You can create scenarios. You can put people in different situations. And of course, it's very important you work in different environments as well. I think over the years, we've worked everywhere from in a, a sort of sports hall to a field, to woods, to a car, to inside the gents toilet at a, at a particular club we were using, to the, the corridor and entranceway of that club. We've worked in a bar before, the owner let us in after hours, so we were around the tables and the stalls and everything. Basically you want to mix those things up as much as you can, because these all present different challenges. So again we're trying to get away from that sort of sometimes clinical aspect of sparring, which can be good for certain developments, development of, of certain tools, for example. But once we've got that, we want to bring it out into the sort of environments we're going to find ourselves in day to day. That testing work, by the way, I occasionally put little bits up of that on YouTube clips, or you can see some more examples of it in some of the downloads. But generally, it's something I avoid putting out if people are being tested, particularly with some of the more intense work, that's a very personal experience for them. Again, we're working on lots of different levels. We're working on physical levels, psychological, emotional levels. So that work is very personal to that person. And to me, that's not something I want to put out for general entertainment value. And I realise, of course, in today's world that a lot of martial arts stuff is about entertainment giving people what they want to see. This to me has the risk of breeding quite an unhealthy mindset amongst people, uh, where they sit there with their big tub of popcorn, uh, sort of, what's the phrase, armchair quarterback in whatever's going along on screen or criticizing or, you know, sometimes saying it's good as well. Uh, in any event, it's you that should be doing it. So yes, we'll put YouTube clips up. From my perspective, it's hopefully information based to give people information not so much entertainment and the thing that strikes me now is to be successful in martial arts on YouTube all you have to do is set up a channel criticizing other people you get thousands of subscribers you get loads of views The more controversial and outspoken you are the better but are all these people watching actually doing any training themselves so in that sense I'd rather forego all that and just get on with our training so, having said that, I think it's time to draw things to a close. I'll try to keep that as short as I can. Of course, there's loads of other things we could be speaking about here. I hope that that sort of clarifies a few things for people with an interest in Systema or people think we only ever train in one way. Of course, feel free to ask any questions, either comment below or on our Facebook page. Please like, please share. Uh, and at the moment also we're doing an offer. If you sign up for our newsletter, you'll get a 20% discount on any films, any books, any downloads that you order through the site. So the link will be in the notes below. Thanks for watching. Take care.